us looking for a bus station. We cut through this old school cemetery and back out onto a street that led us to the first part of Highway 1, where we stood at the side of the road and tried to hitchhike. But nobody picked us up, so we kept walking. We followed along the side of 1 through this grassy presidio area and a fancy golf course at and then down 14th Ave. We ducked through Golden Gate Park, and when we got to the other side, we were on 19th Ave. It was hot as hell, and we were all exhausted from being up so long, but we still just walked and walked and walked, and none of us complained any, even though we hadn't eaten anything, and we were worried about getting to Mexico and how May Lee said Mom was sick. And we kept walking, wiping forehead sweat every five seconds and constantly looking over our shoulders. I thought about that, why none of us complained. Maybe it's just because we're young and don't know any better, or because we were thinking so much about how it'd be in Mexico, or we were too stressed about getting picked up by some cop car that would eventually come creeping up over the hill behind us and flip on their lights, or maybe us three are just tougher than how some people might be. But after a while, I came up with this other theory. Maybe the real reason we didn't complain is because secretly, unconsciously, or whatever, we thought we deserved to suffer, for real. We'd all done something bad to be put in a group home in the first place, right? And then last night, we just walked out, cut short our sentences, made plans to live somewhere else where we could start over fresh and have a better life of freedom and finance tourist girls from all around the world. But shouldn't we still have to pay for what we did? Shouldn't we have to suffer somehow? Maybe us going on this never-ending walk like this with no food or water or sleep, with the sun burning down on the backs of our necks, maybe that was the only way we could think of to make the world seem balanced again. Otherwise, you could just do any damn thing you wanted in this life, and I don't think that shit's true. Eventually, we cut into the heart of some college campus because Mom said there might be a bus station somewhere inside. All the college kids wandering around made me think of Jaden's goofy ass, how he said those were the best days of his life and maybe I could go too because I got good grades. They were roaming around with backpacks and flip-flops or sitting on little grassy hills eating lunch or laying out in the sun on towels with books in their hands or sleeping. It's easy for a guy like Jaden to say you could go to college, but he fits right in, and that's his job, to say other people could too. But walking around looking at everybody, I felt a million miles away from all of them, from college, like it was in a completely different galaxy from a kid like me. When we finally got to the station, we stood in front of the counter and stared at all the possible places to go. This gray-haired lady with big, thick glasses sitting in the booth turned on her mic and said, Where are you fellas headed? South, Mom said. She smiled. I'm going to need you gentlemen to be a little more specific. Something cheap that goes along the coast, Monk said. She looked down at the paper in front of her and then back up at us. Got a bus like that just pulled up into the station, she said. You guys hurry, you can still make it. I stepped to the window with the leather petty cash envelope, paid her for three tickets, and we hustled around the corner to where the buses were, trying to make it on ours before it left. We found bus 47 and stood at the bottom of the entrance with our tickets in hand. Before we climbed aboard with our bags, I asked the skinny black driver, how long till we leave? He looked down at his watch and said, I'd be pulling her out in exactly six minutes. He reached for my ticket, stared at it for a sec, and looked at me, handed it back. All the way to UC Santa Cruz, huh? Or as far south as we can get, that's still by the beach, Monk said. The driver nodded. I looked at Mom, wondering how he knew so much about geography, not only San Francisco and Santa Cruz, but Mexico. Maybe Renee was right about him being kind of smart. As he and Rondell climbed onto the bus, I went up to the waiting area and bought candy bars and Cokes and chips from the vending machines. Then I went onto the bus, took a full seat next to them in the back, and let Mom and Rondell pick whatever they wanted. Me and Rondell dug in like it was the first time we'd seen food in a damn month, but Mom didn't need a bite. Instead, he just stared at me with this little grin on his face, and not the psycho one I was used to either, just the normal one. You liked her, right? He told me. Who? I said, though I already knew who. Come on, you can tell me. I won't be mad. I studied him first. I didn't know if he was being true about not getting pissed off, so I just didn't say a word about his cousin. Instead, I asked him, yo, man, what's a gong gong? He laughed to himself. It was the first time I'd ever seen Long laugh without being all psycho about it. You'd almost think he was a regular Asian kid with a shaved head if it wasn't for those nasty scars on his cheeks. He took a sip of his Coke and wiped his mouth on the arm of his sweatshirt. It's a Chinese person's grandfather, he said, on the mother's side. I nodded my head but didn't say anything else. I looked over at Rondell, who was chewing away on a candy bar watching us. After a minute or so, Mom tapped me on the shoulder and said, 
She'd probably like you too, except you're so much younger and you're Mexican. He took off his sweatshirt and balled it up, set it between his shoulder and the wind. But who knows, he said. Maybe she wouldn't even care about that. Instead of saying anything back, I shoved the rest of my second candy bar in my mouth and chewed. Wash it down with Coke. Rondell burped so loud, a couple people turned around to look at us. He said, excuse me, though, and they all looked forward. When the driver started the engine and it began rumbling under our seats, I put my hood back up and Mong leaned his head against his sweatshirt and closed his eyes. I looked back at Rondell, who was asleep with his mouth wide open, half a candy bar still in his big ass right hand. I leaned my head against the window, too. All three of us were dead asleep before the bus was even out of the parking lot.